Hello, everyone. I, I would like to uh, let me start the, the, the event of today. Thank you very much for being with us. I, as usual, I would like to welcome you to the Ipatia Colloquium. Uh, as usual, let me remind you that the colloquium is dedicated to early career astronomers. And the, I would like to congratulate you with the speakers who have been selected through a very, a very competitive uh, process. So congratulations, and we are very happy, excited to hear about your science. Um, the very few uh, technical uh, aspects, uh, so questions can be, so the speakers will have a, a half an hour slot each for the talk, 20, 25 minutes for the talk, plus five to 10 minutes for questions. Uh, you can make your questions either if you are participating to the talk through the Zoom meeting, you can make your question yourself directly, just use a raise hand and then you will be given the word by the, the chair of the, the event. If you are following the event on YouTube, then you can send the question either by using the live chat or by using a web form that is available on the IPATIA pages. I posted the link to the web form on the on the chat so you can go and, and send the questions without logging into youtube if you also please be be reminded that all the past me videos of the past events are available on on youtube there is a playlist also on on the on the program page you will see also you will be able to download the pdf of the of the screw rhythm video the cv of our speakers which is a big so is a big source of information. So we always in, encourage people to go there and have a look at the profile of these talented uh, scientists that we are hosting in this series. Uh, so with this, I will stop by giving the word to our to the chair of today, who is who are going to be Laura and uh, Bruno. They are a fellow and student here at ESO, so we are very great grateful for for them to helping us with the chairing of the sessions. Uh, Lara will be starting, I guess, she is an expert in galaxy evolution and galactic physics, so thank you, Laura, and please uh, take over, and thank you very much for being with us again. See you. Okay, thank you, Giacomo, and uh, welcome again to everybody. Uh, today we have two fantastic uh, speakers. We will start with Nikki Arense, who will talk about the hot topic of the existing tension between the CMB and low redshift observation. So Nikki is doing her PhD in the Dark Cosmology Center at the Niels Bohr Institute, which is part of the University of Copenhagen. And before that, she obtained her bachelor and master degrees at the Kaftein Institute in Groningen. So her talk is entitled Cosmic Dissonance, a new physics or systematics behind a short sound horizon. So before uh, giving the floor to Nikki, just uh, again to remind people that uh, please go ahead and ask your questions through the um, YouTube ch uh, chat and we will go through them at the end of the talk. And the same goes for people who are watching us from Zoom who are also, who can also ask their questions by raising their hands at the end of the talk. So um, Nikki, whenever you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. You can share your screen. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, do you see my slides? Yeah, perfect. Great. Uh, okay, let me start by really thanking the organizers for starting this seminar series and still giving us opportunity to share our work in these weird times. Um, <clears throat> and the work I'll be presenting today is carried out at DARK at the University of Copenhagen, together with my supervisor, Radek Wojtek, and with Adriana Aiello. And our work focuses on the present day expansion rate of the universe, or the Hubble constant. And the Hubble constant doesn't just give us the expansion rates in the present, but we also needed to calculate the exp expansion rates in the past and in the future. And then if we combine all this knowledge, and we have the expansion history of the universe, we can use it to determine the age. And a bit closer to home, we also need to know how much the universe has expanded in order to link distances to a certain redshift. So all of this combined, the Hubble, the Hubble constant is really one of the most important cosmological parameters. And yet we know that when it comes to the Hubble constant, we have a problem. So let me start by recapping the two different ways how you can determine the Hubble constant. And the first one is the local or the empirical approach. 
and this is very similar to how Edwin Hubble and Lemaitre did it in their days. And it combines information um, from the distance and velocity or redshift of astronomical objects. Um, and then, depending on which data set you get, this, uh, this gives a, a high value of the Hubble constant, around 73. Uh, the second way is using the cosmic microwave background radiation. And then by looking at peaks in the power spectrum, we can infer cosmological parameters uh, at recombination. And then using a cosmological model, we can extrapolate it to the current time to give us the Hubble constant. Now, this method gives a lower value of the Hubble constant, around uh, 67. So the difference between these two values is often referred to as the Hubble tension. And it's really one of the biggest problems in current day cosmology, because of course, it might be caused by some hidden systematics in one of the two measurements, but it also questions our understanding of the universe, because the CMB or the model dependent approach uses lambda CDM as the cosmological model. So this means that if something is wrong with lambda CDM, this might explain why we get a lower value from the CMB. Um, and this has led to a lot of new uh, models being proposed, new cosmological models, uh, with the goal of uh, solving the Hubble tension. So the question I'll be addressing in this talk today is whether modifications of lambda CDM can solve the Hubble tension. And before we dive into that, we actually have to take a bit of a step back. Because even though this problem is always referred to as a Hubble tension, it's not just about H0. So another important cosmological parameter that I'd like to focus on in this talk is the sound horizon. And the sound horizon is a distance scale that originates in the early universe because the baryons are ionized and the photons are trapped. So they form this uh, photon baryon plasma. And if there is an overdensity in this early universe, then matter is attracted to it gravitationally, but there's also this photon pressure directed outwards. And these counteracting forces of gravity and pressure result in oscillations, very similar to sound waves. So these sound waves then continue to travel outwards as the universe is cooling down until the universe cools down enough to become transparent. Um, so then the photons and the baryons decouple uh, and the photons can finally travel freely which is where we observe them as cosmic microwave background radiation. And all these structures that uh, have been formed in this process are frozen in place at this time. So the radius of the sound waves at recombination is the sound horizon. And because these are shells with a slightly higher density, it also means that when the universe is developing and forming structures, that more galaxies and clusters are formed around these shells. And this is something that we can still see today if we look at the clustering of galaxies. Here you can see an artistic impression. Um, but yeah, these, this preferred scale of clustering is referred to as a baryon acoustic oscillation measurement. And these BAO measurements are really, really useful uh, because they don't just give us information about the sound horizon, but also about the Hubble constant. Because if we consider one of these BAO signatures, like here, then this can either be explained by a short sound horizon, a low sound horizon, in combination with a high expansion rate, or by a high sound horizon and a low expansion rate, so a low Hubble constant. And in this way, the BAO measurements constrain the product of H and LTRS. So this means that they're very degenerate with each other. And here you can see the H and LTRS plane, where this yellow banana shape is everything that BAO constrains. And you need to break this degeneracy in some way. So the CMB measurements by Planck, they do that by measuring a high sound horizon and a low Hubble constant, while the local measurements get a low sound horizon and a high Hubble constant. So these parameters are really intertwined with each other. Um, and that's why in our research, we didn't just focus on the Hubble constant, but we did a, a joint determination of the Hubble constant and the sound horizon. And we used uh, local data sets to do this. So let me quickly go over which data sets we used for this. So firstly, to map out the shape of the expansion history, we used type 1a supernovae and BAO measurements. Uh, and here you can see how these data sets are distributed over redshift. But these are only relative distance indicators. So we still need to calibrate them. 
And usually this is done with uh, cepheids or stars at the tip of the red giant branch or surface brightness fluctuations. But the, the disadvantage of these methods is that they can only be measured at relatively low redshifts. So it might be a bit risky to then extrapolate this calibration to our high redshift data points. And for that reason, we are also using six gravitationally lensed quasars from the Holy Cow collaboration. So here, uh, the Holy Cow collaboration has determined very accurate distances to these quasar systems. Okay, so let's get a bit of an overview of how these quasar systems work. So we have an observer and then a massive lens galaxy and behind it is a distant quasar. And the light of the quasar is now magnified and also bent by the gravitational potential of the lens galaxy. So in this case, this results in two images of the same object. And quasars also have uh, slight variations of their brightness over time. And because the light of the quasar uh, travels a different path to the images and is also affected differently by the lensing potential, this means that the variations will arrive at different times at the images. And with very extensive monitoring campaigns, we can actually measure this uh, difference in arrival time. And this time delay uh, then scales with the gravitational potential of the lens and also with the ratio of distances between the observer, the lens, and the source. And this ratio of distances is called the time delay distance. So it means that if we measure the time delay and we have a model for the lens potential, then we can constrain the time delay distance, which in turn scales inversely with the Hubble constant. So going back to our data points, if we now add the calibration of the lens squasers, you see that they really calibrate the data at much higher redshifts. Okay, so this all sounds really nice, but actually using lens squasers for cosmology is not without challenges. And one major uh, challenge is the mass sheet degeneracy. And this arises because um, if you have a quasar system and you scale everything up or down to a different size, then the time delays will be affected, but the imaging observables will remain the same. And this means that it's really difficult to constrain a mass profile if you only have imaging data. Uh, and to break this degeneracy, you really need something that uh, constrains the true size of the system, like uh, velocity dispersion measurement of the lens galaxy. And then because this, this um, mass profile of the lens is also an equation for the time delay distance, uh, it means that there's this really tricky degeneracy between the lens mass model and the final valuable constant. Now in the Holy Cow, they partly broke this degeneracy by making some assumptions um, about the shape of the mass profile. I hope my um, So yeah, they made some assumptions about the shape of the mass profile. Um, for example, that it's a power law. Uh, and this then gave a value of the Hubble constant of around 73.3 with quite small uncertainties. But there's also been a different analysis of the same uh, six lens quasars with one other one. And in this case, uh, the TD Cosmo collaboration relaxed some of the assumptions on the mass profile. Uh, and instead of that, they used an external data set of 33 lensed galaxies. So these are not lensed quasars, so they don't have time delay measurements, but they do have velocity dispersion measurements. Uh, and this can also break the degeneracy. And doing this uh, gave a lower value of the Hubble constant of 67.4, which is <laughs> exactly Planck. But the uncertainties are uh, a lot larger. And this approach relies on, on a different assumption, which is that the galaxies and lens quasars um, are from the same parent distribution. So this sort of shows how difficult it can be to get local measurements of the Hubble constant. Okay, so combining everything, look uh, at the results that we get. So initially we just used um, Taibonai Supernovae and BAO, uh, calibrated by Schutt and Holy Cow, which gives uh, these one sigma contours. And if we compare these contours with the CMB measurements from Planck, then you really get this familiar picture of a really strong tension between the local and the CMB measurements. But this is not the whole story anymore. And there have also been different local measurements that give a slightly different outcome. So I'm just gonna show a few here. Um, surface brightness fluctuations, the same lenses, but then with uh, TD Cosmo analysis, 
and the tip of the red giant branch. And these all give slightly lower values of the Hubble constant. And there's also a lot of uh, other measurements that have been done. But the, the main point here is that the tension is not as clear cut anymore as it may used to be. And it's really only when you combine Schuess and Holy Cow that you get this really strong five sigma tension between the CMB and local ones. But nevertheless, these are still very important data sets, so we should take them seriously. Um, and just to remind you that um, the local measurements don't depend on the cosmology, um, but the CMB measurements do. So in order to do those measurements, they use the Lambda CDM model. And this then um, arises the question whether we can make some changes to Lambda CDM that can move these contours of the CMB closer in the direction of the local ones and therefore reconcile the tension. Okay, so for our research, we um, investigated four of these extensions to Lambda CDM, but these are really just examples of two categories that most models fall into. So the first category uh, are models that change the early physics, so before recombination. Um, and in order to see how they work, let's first uh, take a look at how the Hubble constant can be derived from the CMB. And this is done by first inferring the distance between us and the CMB. Um, and here for you need the sound horizon. So we can determine the physical size of the sound horizon by the sound speed in the early universe, which depends on the density of baryons and photons. Uh, and then we also know the time that has passed between the Big Bang and recombination. So combining this, you can calculate the maximum distance that the sound waves could have traveled in that time, which is the sound horizon. And then we can get the angular size of the sound horizon from the fluctuations in the CMB by looking at the power spectrum and the position of the first peak. And then combining this physical and angular size of the sound horizon, uh, this gives us an angular diameter distance from us to the CMB. Um, so what these models do, the early time modifications, they introduce some components in the early universe that contributes to the energy density. So this can be, for example, early dark energy or some sort of dark radiation. Um, but they all have in common that they increase the expansion rate in the early universe, which then shortens the time between the Big Bang and recombination. So it also shortens the distance the sound waves could have traveled in that time. So we get a shorter sound horizon. And now we still measure the same angular size. So it means that we determine a shorter distance between us and the CMB, and shorter distances corresponds to a higher Hubble constant. For the second class of models, nothing changed before recombination, but compared to the, the standard scenario, where here you have space expanding according to the standard lambda CDM model, um, in, in these new models, there is a late time phase of extra accelerated expansion, which also leads to a higher Hubble constant. Um, and how this can be done is by changing the properties of dark energy. So in the lambda CDM model, uh, the dark energy density is constant over time. But in these new models, you can make uh, the dark energy density increase over time, which then uh, gives you uh, this effect of more accelerated expansion, a higher Hubble constant. It also leads to the big rip. So maybe these models are not the, the nicest scenario. Um, but when we compare these two uh, categories of models, so early time, late time modifications, the main difference is that for early time modifications, you change both the sound horizon and the Hubble constant. And for the late time ones, you only change the Hubble constants. And as we will see now, this is also the reason why those models do not work. So going back to our results, um, and here I've just combined the contours from Schuess and Hurley Cow to give the most extreme interpretation of the tension. <clears throat> um, so let's have a look at the effects of the early time modifications on the CMB contours. So here you see that um, they move the contours closer to the local ones, so it definitely reduces the tension. But if you take Schuess and Holy Cow together, it's not really enough. Um, and this is because there's really a, a limit on how effective these models can be while still giving a good fit to the CMB data. Okay, moving on to the late time modifications. So this can only change the value of the Hubble constant and not the sound horizon. You see that the contours can only move to the right in this diagram. So 
it really is not a solution to the combined tension. Even though some of these models uh, have been put forward as really promising solutions to the Hubble tension, but that's really only a half solution. Now, besides this um, sound horizon Hubble constant tension, there are also some other cosmological tensions that new models need to take into account. Um, one of them is the growth tension, which is a weak tension between sigma eight omega matter um, between large scale structure and CMB measurements. And well, the early time modifications were the only sort of promising ones when it came to the sound horizon. It turns out that they actually worsen the growth tension. So here, um, model two and three are models that actually in an increasing way solve the tension in H not RS, but you see that they create a whole new problem here. And lately it has been shown that later modifications suffer from this problem as well. So I'd really like to emphasize that when it comes to solving the Hubble tension, we should really adopt a holistic approach. So don't just focus on H not, but also on the sound horizon, sigma eight, omega matter. Um, it would be great if we can solve multiple tensions at once, but at least we have to make sure to not make any of the existing tensions any worse or create any new tensions. So that brings me back to the final question of the talk. Can modifications of lambda CDM solve the Hubble tension? Well, in my opinion, the answer is no, because there doesn't seem to be a single model that can really uh, solve the tension in a satisfying way in all the cosmological parameters of interest. So early time modifications reduce tension in H0 and RS, but they worsen the growth tension. And late time modifications only solve the tension in H0 and not in RS, and <laughs> they also worsen the growth tension. So what then? Systematics? Well, maybe. And I think it's really important to have more independent measurements of the Hubble constant and sound horizon to figure this out. And one of the upcoming uh, probes to do this that I would like to highlight at the end of this talk is gravitationally lensed supernovae. So this works the same way as the lensed quasars. Then we have a supernova instead of a quasar behind a lensed galaxy. So you can imagine that it can be quite difficult to catch this lensed supernova in time before it fades away. Um, and up to date, there have only been three discoveries of actually resolved images of a lensed supernova, where uh, this last one only uh, came out on the archive a few days ago. So that's pretty cool. But even though the sample now is uh, quite small, um, with uh, the future surface like LSST or the Roman telescope in Euclid, they are predicted to really catch several hundreds a year. So it means that we're in this quite special position where um, we have a small data set now, but we know it's really going to expand in the coming years. Uh, and that's why at DARK, we are also working on predicting the constraints from gravitationally lensed supernovae on, for example, the Hubble constant. So I'll quickly show you some work here that I'm uh, working on with Dugas Cody Ramana and Radek Wojtek. And uh, we are developing two machine learning algorithms where the first one uh, takes image input from surveys and then it predicts how likely it is to be a normal supernova or a lens supernova. And this will be really important when we have um, extremely large amounts of data coming in every night to automatically make a short list of promising candidates so then we can go through it ourselves. And the second project is um, taking time series of images uh, and then inferring the Hubble constant from those. So with these methods and with the upcoming large uh, survey data in the future, we hope that we can uh, shed some light on this Hubble tension. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions now or maybe hear some uh, different opinions on this topic. Okay. Thank you very much, Nikki, uh, for the presentation. It's been very clear and, and also very, very interesting. So I'm going to... Check people. Um, don't forget that if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them through the Maybe YouTube chat. And also, if you are, yeah, sorry. No, okay. And uh, yeah, also if you are in Zoom, you can also ask your question and uh, 
in the chat or raise your hand to ask them. And uh, while people think about their questions, I have one myself. So at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that um, only uh, CMB depended on the, on the lambda cold dark matter paradigm. But uh, the low redshift observations are independent of it. But you mentioned that, uh, for example, uh, the shows data set uh, relies on some assumptions for the mass uh, profiles. So I don't know if you can go back to the slide. Yes, for the holy cow, you mean, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Exactly. So, is this uh, do this assumption on the mass profile don't rely on 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 any issue related with the lambda C and D paradigm? Yeah, it's a good question because this is actually really tricky. So, the main thing is that a CMB has to use a cosmological model. It cannot infer the Hubble constant without it. And local measurements in principle can be done without it, but this also means that um, in order to, um, to describe the shape of the expansion history, you have to use some other model. So maybe some Taylor expansion that doesn't depend on lambda CDM, for example. But these models also have their own issues. So it's actually very difficult to find a good model to do this uh, without, uh, yeah, without introducing some other bias. And then the other thing that you say is, so for the lenses, it's yeah. the mass profile. And for other data sets, there's also other effects that you need to correct for. So it's very difficult to make sure that there's no model dependency creeping in anywhere. And I think this is also the reason why the measurements from the local data sets um, are not all agree with each other. So there might still be some, some issues there. Okay, okay. Great, so thank you for the answer. So you also mentioned at the end of, uh, of the talk something about lens the supernovae and the recent uh, works in this uh, regard. So is there any already any result about the Hubble uh, constant uh, using this lens uh, supernovae? Yes. Um yeah I, I think not yet okay so there's different ones so for this one in the middle um it's actually quite a symmetric system so the time delays were really short like of the order of several days so in that case it's quite impossible to really get an accurate enough estimate to constrain the Hubble, con the Hubble constant um for this one i think they are working on it because they also predicted another image to pop up a few years later, which exactly at the predicted time it also came up. So this leads to new constraints. But as far as I know, they haven't published the final value yet. And then for this final system, um, they I think they've observed the first three images and then they predict that this one will arrive in maybe 10 or 20 years. So to get the final constraints, we also have to wait for a bit longer. But Definitely for these two systems, there will be estimates of the Hubble constants coming out that are actually quite uh, accurate. I don't remember the position, but maybe 6% uh, or so from one system. So imagine if you have a lot more, this will get much better. Okay, so thank you, Nikki. Uh, we have also a question in the YouTube chat, which is made by Divya uh, Mish Mishra. Sorry for mispronouncing it. So, um, the question is, recently type two supernovae are also being used for calculating the Hubble constant. What are the pros and cons of using these types of supernovae? Um, well, the pros is that you have more measurements, of course, but the cons, I think it's quite difficult because uh, they're not standard candles in the same way as type 1A supernovae, that it's very easy to standardize them. Um, yeah, I have to say, I don't know exactly what the results are, but it would be great if we can also use them. But there's also a lot more physics involved that you need to find some way to make them all standardizable. So this again brings in some assistance. Thank you. Uh, we have also another question, in, this time in, in the Zoom chat from Bruno Rodriguez. He thanks you uh, for the talk. Uh, he said that this is the first time he learns about the uh, sound horizon, 
and he asked if uh, there is any reason why most discussions of the crisis in cosmology focus uh, solely, solely on the, the Hubble constant. I don't know. I guess if you make a new model, it's nicer to just focus on the whole constant because then it's easier to solve. Um, I do think that there's a trend that people are really starting to use the BA measurements as well and also look at the effects on the sigma eta mega matter tension. So I, th I think we're moving more in that we consider everything. Um, also, for example, considering the measurements of the age of the universe, because um, a high constant gives you a sure that's not compatible with measurements and of course that's, that's also not good uh, so yeah i hope we're moving more in that sort of complete direction okay great okay so thank you very much for the answers uh, nikki i think that we don't have any other questions uh, so far so i just remind people that if you have further questions you can uh, contact uh, Nikki, uh, you have uh, her info in the in the web page. So now uh, we thank we thank you again, Nikki, for this uh, very nice presentation, and we move on to thank you, Bruno, who will chair the second uh, speaker of today. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Laura, for introducing me, and thanks, Nikki, for your wonderful talk. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, uh, in this session of the Hypatia Colloquium. It's uh, an honor for me to be here to present our next speaker, who is Jose Eduardo Mendez Delgado. He is a PhD student in astrophysics at the Universidad de la Laguna and the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias in the Canary Islands. He is originally from Mexico and previously he obtained his bachelor in physics from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico and his master's in astrophysics from the Universidad de la Laguna. So today, Jose is going to give us a talk on the photoionized herbic halo objects in the, Orion, in the Orion Nebula through deep high spectral resolution spectroscopy. So we can welcome him. Uh, I should remind you if you have any questions to please put them in the chat, either on Zoom or on YouTube. And without further ado, I give you the floor, Jose. Um, please take it away. Thank you very much. Hello to everyone. I am Jose Eduardo Mendez Delgado. And I'm going to talk about my thesis work on photoionized herbicaro objects in the Orion Nebula. In first place, I would like to thank to the organizers of the colloquium for permitting me to be here uh, talking to you. My collaborators and I have developed a series of papers of which two of them have already been published. The last one is available in the AstroPH since the last week. It was recently as accepted in the astrophysical journal. So I came here with very, very fresh, fresh news. So first of all, let me introduce you to these fascinating objects discovered by George Herbig and Guillermo Aro. Uh, they are small emission nebulae associated to all flows from newly born stars. These objects are considered to be originated through a centrifugal magnetic launch mechanism from young stellar objects. And since their discovery in the 50s, several of them have been studied. Uh, these objects have a very evident, uh, they are very evident when they propagate in neutral environments since their shock uh, dominate the emission of lines in the visible spectrum. In fact, this is the most common idea of these objects between the community. Ejections of material from new stars whose ionization has been originated in shocks. We can visualize the physical idea by thinking that the ejected material uh, interacts with the surrounding medium in a very thin layer that heats the gas, exciting it and ionizing it, while behind this thin uh, layer of gas, uh, a cooling zone is formed and it's releasing all that energy through the emission of collision at excited lines of metals and recombination lines of hydrogen and helium, the most common elements. Uh, however, despite the presence of emission lines of the different ions that compose the gas, knowing the exact chemical composition of these objects, it's very difficult since it's necessary to know the temperature and the density in each volume of gas that is emitting radiation. And since the gas is not in equilibrium, uh, there are strong changes in the physical conditions in each observed point. So, if these objects are formed in young stars, one will expect 
that there will be a large number of them in H2 regions where there are many stars forming. And indeed that happens. Multiple jets of gas can be found traveling through the uh, gas of the Orion Nebula. But in the Orion Nebula, there is a significant difference. The stars of the Orion trapezium generate a very strong radiation field capable of ionize the surrounding gas with their emission of photons. So the shock between the ambient gas and the Herbig halo uh, merely serves to create a dense bluff where we can apply the standard methods to derive con physical conditions and chemical abundances in ionized nebula. Uh, when the photoionization equilibrium dominate, dominates, the gas maintains a fixed temperature by heating by photoionization and cooling from the emission of lines and free free radiation. Uh, the radiation field of the, strong, of the Orion Nebula is strong enough, so the energy that it's input from the shock is very small and in most cases, in most cases negligible. Here I show you a GIF that we made with uh, HH204 with images of the Hubble Space Telescope taken in the uh, Huygens region, uh, Huygen region of the Orion Nebula over 20 years. I thought the jet mainly moves in one direction there are several gas interactions that are moving in several directions. Uh, so uh, the next questions are, what are we gonna get from, from this study of Herbie Caro objects in the Orion Nebula? Uh, first of all, let me show you this beautiful image of the Orion Nebula uh, that is uh, present here with a filter that is centered in the nitrogen line or uh, nitrogen plus line uh, 6584. Uh, an ion of low degree of ionization. Many Herbig Haro objects can be observed uh, and they're very evident as bullets uh, traveling around, uh, around the Orion Nebula. However, many other Herbig Haro objects that are present are not emitting radi the radiation in this image since the radiation is mainly uh, emitted in highly ionized ions revealing and this reveals a variety of different conditions present in the gas. And in fact, this is the image, uh, a realistic image of what we'll expect from NH2 region, several gas interaction. So if we can study the photoionized Herbig Haro objects in the Orion Nebula as a small H2 regions, we can understand with unprecedented detail the physics of these objects and in general, the determination of chemical abundances in star forming regions and ionized nebula. So we want to know uh, the physical conditions and ionic composition of these objects, the relationship of these properties with the geometry, kinematics and dynamics of the gas. We want to understand the origin of these Herbig Haro objects and their impact and relationship with the star formation regions inside of the Orion Nebula, such as Orion South. Uh, we also want to know the global impact of these shocks on photoionized gas, in particular, the dust destruction process. And for, I would like to first uh, introduce you in the standard way of how we calculate things in, chem in ionized nebula. And the standard way is to, ana to analyze the, the chemical composition of an ionized nebula is first to determine the physical conditions of temperature and density. And this is achieved by measuring some intensity line ratios that are sensitive to these quantities. And then with the intensity of emission lines of several ions, we can, we can calculate their abundance by solving the equations of a statistical equilibrium. And there are two important physical processes that dominate the production of uh, emission lines in ionized gas, collisional excitation and recombination. The first one are produced by collision of a free ele electron with uh, kinetic energy of the order of the atomic levels involved that excite the atom. And the latter is produced by the capture of free electrons uh, in an ion. So the collisional excited lines are produced mainly in metals and there are uh, and several in their intensity are several orders of magnitude uh, than those that come from recombination in the same ion and therefore are more accessible observationally. However, with modern instruments, recombination lines have been detected in a large number of objects and we have, uh, we have found a very big problem. The abundances obtained with collisional excited lines do not coincide with those obtained by recombination lines. Uh, the lighter ones always predict larger abundances. So it's a good possibility that much 
much of the knowledge that we know about the chemical evolution of the universe, that it's mainly based on collisional excited lines, has big errors. And that worries us very much. And this is what we know as the abundance discrepancy problem. Uh, the detailed knowledge of the physics of photoionized regions is important since it is the base of many studies, for example, many relationships that make it possible to determine the chemical composition of galaxies, metallicities, and other properties. But as well as the problem of the abundance discrepancy, there are many other phenomena that we do not fully understand and that can have an important impact in the physical interpretations that we make of the universe, such as temperature fluctuations, lump of different chemical composition, unexplored recombination process in the atomic levels, commonly populated by collision and along with cetera. So we want to know what happens with these problems in photoionized Herbicaro objects uh, that are perfect laboratories to, uh, to test our methods uh, to derive chemical abundances. So we base our work on high uh, spectral resolution spectroscopy of the very large telescope and high spatial resolution imaging from the Hubble Space Telescope we are able to solve different kinematic components that are present in the gas. In this talk, I will uh, give some of the results that uh, we published in the first two articles of our series uh, that are related to Henry Haro, HH 529-2 and 3 and HH 204, uh, which are shown in these images along the position of our US slit. So this is how we work with the UVS spectra. In the first picture, we have the position of the, of the UVS slit. Uh, we reduce the observational uh, data to obtain the two-dimensional spectra. We spatially isolate the different kinematic components by cutting the 2D spectra. In this case, we can see two, uh, two high velocity components. And we finally obtain one-dimensional spectra uh, separating, uh, spectrally separating all the different kinematic components. In H2, uh, in HH204, in addition to the two definite cuts, we studied the pixel to pixel emission at the scale of 0 0.2 arc seconds per pixel. This allowed us to have deep and detailed spectra with thousands and thousands of emission lines with, which were carefully measured by, by, by hand, one by one, and with by, by hand, I mean with the IRAF task S plot. And we can study also the proper motions and trajectories of the Herbie Haro objects by using the image of the Orion Nebula with the Hubble Space Telescope over several years. Furthermore, we can estimate the spatial distribution and variation in the emission of some lines. I will go straight to some results obtained in HH 529, 2, and 3 before taking, talking about. Uh, HH204. First of all, we found that the contribution of energy by the shock is small and can be neg neglected. How, we do, how do we get this? By comparing the flux contribution of the cooling zone that it's originated after the shock passage that has to be equal to the kinetic energy released in the shock with the radiative flux of the gas in equilibrium that is proportional to the square of the post-shock density and by the thickness of the work surface. So once we verify that the spectrum of the Herbie Haro objects is, is consistent with that of a small scale H2 region, we derive its physical condition and we observe a very strong compression of the gas that increase the density by up to a factor of five respect to the nebular values of the surrounding areas. Although the temperature remains basically with the same values due to the photoionization equilibrium. We determine the ionic abundances of several ions but thanks to the high degree of ionization of the gas, the abundances of helium, carbon, oxygen, chlorine, argon, and iron were obtained without any kind of ionization correction factor. These uh, ICFs are relationships that are based on predictions of photoionization models or similarities between the ionization potentials of some ions that calculate the contribution of the, to the total abundance of the ions whose emission is not present in the spectrum. These factors are for very useful. We, they have uh, significant uncertainties. So we explore the abundant discrepancy problem with the combination lines of oxygen, neon, and carbon, uh, finding that the paradigm of temperature fluctuations of, pain, of Painberg is not capable of explaining the discrepancy found in HH 529.2 and 3. 
at least by itself, there must be another physical phenomena causing this abundance discrepancy problem. Uh, a good candidate for this uh, in, in, in this herbicide object may be the inclusion of hydrogen deficient material from a peripheral area of the accretion disk of the source of HH 529. This phenomena also will explain the slight overabundance of heavy elements that are found in, in this herbicide object with respect to the Orion Nebula. Although there are several studies in infrared that show indications of this possibility, the hypothesis requires a bit further analysis. Uh, so we find uh, also a direct evidence of dust destruction by the increase of the abundances of iron by a factor of 2.35 with respect to the nebular values. It is interesting to analyze the level of dust destruction in each object and to know what factors favor this process, such as flow velocity or the degree of ionization. Now, oh, this is one, uh, one gift that we also made with the uh, images of the HST. In the case of HH204, in addition to the analysis similar that we made with HH529, we studied the mission uh, pixel by pixel. Uh, we find a steady increase of the density when we approach to the bow shock, reaching values of 20,000 higher than the neighbor values that are, are around 1,000 at the position of our slit. Pixel by pixel, we derive also the temperature of nitrogen and sulfur that are representative of the low and intermediate ionization stages, and they are approximately constant around 9,000 Kelvin. Uh, that implies that they are in photoionization equilibrium. However, the temperature of oxygen-3 that is representative of the high ionization ions shows a very prominent gradient. And this extraordinary behavior in the forbidden O3 emission can also be detected in the HST images. Another border uh, of high ratio of O3 and H alpha can be observed. Uh, the interpretation of this result is based on the contribution of the different layers of HH204. Uh, the shock dissipates the kinetic energy that heats the gas and forms a cooling zone out of photoionization equilibrium. The length of this cooling zone is inversely proportional to the density, and in your case, it's very thin since our object is very dense. The gas then cools down and reaches the equilibrium in the back layer and in the jet. These two last zones which already achieved the photoionization equilibrium, essentially contains ions of low and intermediate degree of ionization. Therefore, any emission from the cooling zone of ions such as oxygen plus is negligible with respect to the contribution of the layers in equilibrium. However, the emission of highly ionized ions basically only comes from the cooling zone. But we don't have to be scared about the shock. Its global contribution is also negligible. We have, to, uh, we have estimated that the proportion of gas with high degree of ionization is less than 1%. We have been able to determine the temperature of oxygen-3 and the abundances of oxygen++ plus plus due to the deepness of our spectra, but the, uh, the emission is rather very faint. As we can see, the abundance of oxygen++ plus plus is at least 2.8 dex less than that of oxygen+. Plus. And what about the other ionic abundances? Here we present the distributions of once and twice ionized ions of chlorine, sulfur, iron, and nickel. And at closer distances from the bow shock, the density is very high and the degree of ionization is basically zero. Uh, as the ionic abundances of once and twice uh, ionized ions get stabilized at distances of approximately five milliparsecs uh, from the bow shock, the contribution of ions of three or more times ionized is zero. And we can calculate the total abundances of these elements without any uh, uh, ionization correction factor with the greatest detail uh, uh, possible precision. And we have been able to do this with oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, sulfur, nickel, and iron. In fact, we also showed that the iron and nickel have similar depletion and ionization patterns, which allow us to calculate the abundance of this uh, of both elements by determining only one of them. And what about the abundance discrepancy problem? Well, we don't have that problem, at least with oxygen. Both the, rec the recombination lines and the collision are excited lines provide the same value, unlike what happened in basically all the ionized nebula. Uh, there are several factors that may be key on this. 
Our detailed study revealed that there are no significant temperature inhomogeneities for the gas in equilibrium. And based on the known geometry of the object that flows at the small angle with respect to the plane of the sky, it is likely that we are not integrating love of chemical inhomogeneities within the line of sight. And now I'm, I want to talk about an issue that it's important for many studies of ionized nebula, not only for heavy cargo objects. In particular, for those who work with planetary nebula or high density regions, or even for those who determine galactic metallicities by adding the emission of several H2 regions. Sometimes we take for granted that the sum of the spectra of several components will always give us the spectrum from which we will obtain average representative values from all the added components. Well, this is not always the case, and this is a warning. We, know, we now explore the results that we will get if our observation have low or intermediate spectral resolution. We mix the, the different kinematic components found in our slit, the emission of the herbic halo objects, the diffuse, the diffuse blue layer, and the main nebular emission. And then we analyze this, the resulting spectrum. From the plasma diagnostic, if we follow the classic procedures of taking the density that we will obtain from oxygen two, sulfur two, and chlorine three line ratios, we will underestimate the density. And this implies an overestimation of the temperature. And this is also important because implies an underestimation of the oxygen plus abundance. And this implies an incorrect estimation of the ionization correction factors. And we basically will get uh, incorrect, uh, incorrect chemical abundances for all the elements, and we are not going to be able to correctly interpret the physics that is involved. Uh, HH204 had been studied in previous works with IFU spectra of lower uh, uh, spectral resolution of mu uh, as MUs or PMAS, and these studies uh, interpret the high temperature of, uh, of nitrogen that they found as shock heating. However, in reality, the problem is the density estimation. In fact, the shock, the shock uh, heating of the temperature of oxygen-3 that we show that it's important in this herbic halo object goes unnoticed in the low resolution spectra. With this, I want to show you that the determination of chemical abundances is not just following a series of recipes and that, that we don't have to worry only on having spatial resolution of IFU data. Uh, we also have to know what kinematic components we are integrating in our spectra and have careful analysis of all the emission lines. Uh, but why these classical densities underestimate the density in first place? Uh, the sulfur two and the oxygen two diagnost diagnostics have a very low sensitivity at values uh, higher than 10,000. So the high density of HA204 goes unnoticed. They are basically, basically blind. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the chlorine three diagnostic has a higher sensitivity in this range, but the low degree of ionization of the herbic halo objects provides little contribution to the total emission of this ion. And so this uh, chlorine three diagnostics is via set to the values of the main nebula emission. A good way to detect the high density inclusions from a herbic halo object uh, may be the use of iron three lines uh, as density diagnostic. They will be assessed to the density of the herbic heart object because it is, uh, the sensitivity of this diagnostic is basically zero at values lower than 1,000. And due to the dust destruction uh, in the bow shock, uh, most of the iron emission will come from the herbic heart object. So a short summary of, the, of HH204. Uh, we find that 99% 99, 99 of the gas is in low and intermediate uh, degrees of ionization where the contribution of the shock is negligible. We completely unveil HH204, finding an increase in density at shorter distances from the bow shock, while the representative temperature for the 99% of the gas was kept in equilibrium without fluctuations. And complementing the abundances obtained in HH529, uh, uh, two and three, in these objects, we were able to determine the abundances of oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, sulfur, nickel, and iron without ionization correction factors. The abundances of total oxygen uh, also deserves an important discussion since both the recombination and collisional excited lines show 
an abundance consistent with 8.6, we could say that this is one of the most accurate oxygen determination that exists. And why is this important? Because the chemical abundances of the Orion Nebula are representative of the solar neighborhood. So the, the more precise they are, the better we will know the chemical evolution of our galaxy. So I show you here a brief uh, summary of our results. Uh, some of, of them are already published and some others are gonna be uh, presented in the next papers of the series. And to finish, I would like to introduce some other people of our team of researchers from the ISC, from IRIA at UNAM, from Mexico, and from the University of Texas in the United States. So thank you very much for, uh, for the organizers. And if you have any kind of question, I can, I can be here. Thank you. Hi, thank, thank you very much, Jose. Um, as always, uh, remember you can type in your questions if you want. I'm trying to see if there are any questions in the Zoom chat. Um, there is a question from, from Laura who asks, how large is the sample of Herbig Hara objects discovered so far? And up to what distance are these objects still observed? Is their observation mostly limited to the Milky Way? Yes, they are uh, limited to the, to the Milky Way because uh, in in the H2 regions, all the gas is emitting a lot of radiation. So it's quite difficult to reveal all the internal structure. But uh, I think it's possible to also that, uh, observe these herbic objects in M8 and other galactic H2 regions. Although the majority of the photoionized herbic objects that are being discovered are in the Orion Nebula. Uh, in our series, we are going to focus on nine uh, Herbie Haro objects because we are trying to get different distances with the uh, stars that photoionize the gas and also to reach different uh, physical conditions of density and ionization degree and also uh, different ranges of uh, radial velocity so we can understand how is the dust destruction process in the Orion Nebula and which relation has with these properties. And also we are trying to get different um, flow angles so we can know if there are some differences if these Herbie Haro objects are uh, coming from the north or from the south of the Orion Nebula. Okay, uh, Laura says, same. sounds great, thank you. Uh, I was wondering um, when you look at these nebulae um, if you want to get the abundances of chemical abundances of different different elements or different uh, uh, molecules, do you focus on specific lines? Uh, like, do you manually select which lines you're going to to focus in order to determine the abundance, or do you use some model that takes into account all of the all of the spectral lines? Well, uh, this is one of the points that uh, I will I would like to to discuss, and that actually I discuss in in, in this work. That uh, basically uh, the, a lot of studies of, of chemical abundances are focused in just some strong lines of oxygen three or oxygen two, and with that they try to get all the information that they can. But sometimes it's not possible to get all the correct information with just some some of these lines. That why that's why I, I, I show, for example, that the iron lines may uh, serve us to indicate high density uh, concentrations or some density gradients that are not visible with oxygen two lines or sulfur two lines that are, uh, that are very used in, in, in between the community. So uh, it's better to analyze all the spectra and also to explore the different uh, atomic data that we are using to get all the, the, the chemical uh, abundances and the physical properties. Okay. And uh, I, th I understand that most of these conclusions that you've arrived here at this, um, um, in this study come from the fact that you're using, uh, you know, spectrally resolved, uh, spectra high resolution spectroscopy, right? So, uh, 
when you try to uh, extend that to other models, or when you try to um, give some some uh, recommendations as to how to interpret spectra in the future, um, how does that change if you are using lower resolution spectroscopy, for example? Yeah, for, for example, we made this exercise of mixing all the different components so we can mod model uh, low resolution spectra. And we found that a way of, uh, of getting the real uh, physical conditions is to analyze all the density diagnostics and not only uh, adopt those ones that are like consistent between, between them. For example, the iron lines the density can break the, the, this consistency and give us extra information. But also, for example, recombination lines, if they are detected, can, uh, can be used to determine density, or you can also determine the, the different, uh, the temperature with the Balmer and Passion jump. So it, it's able, we are able to, to see that there are different, uh, different components of, of, of gas that are mixed if you analyze all, uh, all the dif different physical parameters. Okay. Um, I believe Giacomo has his hand raised. Do you yes, have yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, bro. Uh, Jose, really congratulations. Uh, very fascinating science uh, and really, really well presented. Thank you very much. I will read the paper with, more, uh, with a lot of care because it's really fascinating, but I, I'm not an expert. I wanted to have ask you something. Maybe you discuss this, but so uh, if I, do you, so since this, this uh, so you are ionized, the gas is ionized by all star, by massive stars, right? All, all yeah. star. So do you, the accuracy of your study is allowed, maybe is allows you to also give constraints back to the physics of uh, basically ra radiation from massive stars, you know, photons, energy released, uh, you know, all these parameters, I mean, that you, you can, can be basically things that you can give back to the stellar evolution as constraints to, to constrain them the stellar evolution models. Yeah, yeah, it's possible with some uh, line ratios you can get some quantities that give you the softness of the radiation that is coming from the stars that are ionizing the gas, and with that you can give an you can get an estimate of the effective temperature of the stars that are uh, ionizing the gas and you can get some uh, physical information of, this, of the stars. I'll help is not the main, uh, the main goal of our study. Mm -hmm. We also can uh, explore that. And okay. we, we actually see that uh, the, 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 the softness parameters in HH529 give us that mostly all the helium it's ionized because the radiation of the trapezium, it's very strong in this close area where the HH529 is flowing. Yes. So indeed, it is a, a unique laboratory and your approach, you can feed back basically this information to, to give constraints on stellar evolution models of massive yes. stars in a sense. Yes. yes. Yeah, yes, yes. Well, this is great. Yeah, thanks. I think we don't have any further questions. Um, Pavel is raising his hand. Yeah, um, hello, just, just a short question. You, you showed a little movie, I think it was towards the middle of the uh, talk. Um, I think it was a bow shock and two stars and the two stars were also moving. And I just wanted to know, um, could you just show that maybe again, if it's possible? It seemed yeah, to me that sure. everything, everything was moving from the right to the left. And I was wondering um... this this one. Oh yes, because so. in this in this in this gift we uh, put all my or or reference in the bow shock, so the stars are moving. All right. Okay. Okay. So I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions in the chat? Anyone else in the Zoom meeting? Uh, there appear to be no questions from YouTube. So unless there's someone else I haven't seen. Um, 
yeah, I think those are all questions for now. So thank you very much, Jose, for being here with us and giving us your talk. Uh, I should give the floor back to Giacomo so we can close the event. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Laura, for chatting. And also thank you, Nikki and Jose for the very, very beautiful science results that they shown to us. Uh, with this, we close the, 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 um, the event of today. Ipatia, we will we will be back again in July because next week we are all at the IAS. I mean, people will participate to the IAS conference, so we are we we make a pause basically to allow participation to the IAS, and then we will be back at the beginning of July. So with this, I can we can close. Thank you very much again, and see you soon. Bye bye.